Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the Internet's leading all things Charles Band podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jared Hornbeck, a podcast host who likes to keep his dismembered doll parts in the glove compartment for reasons. Mm. And I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. But uh, who is sort of starring with me in this Pinter play? Who's that across from me today? Oh, hi. This is me. It's Steve Guntley. Sorry, I'm not going to be here too long. I'm just popping in to make a quick phone call. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, this is the podcast all about dripping hat boxes, hanging dolls, and of course, jaunty little driving scarves. And that's because this is the podcast about The Caller, a twisty little two-hander that is quietly one of the weirdest and most unique films in the entire Empire catalog. We will get into it. There really is no other movie quite like this in the Empire filmography. And we have a couple of very exciting guests joining us to talk about The Caller. They, they answered the call, if you will. Uh, who here is joining us? Well, I'm very excited to introduce the guests that we have for this episode because, you know, this is a minimalist film in terms of cast. It's really only two actors and, and a lot of whether or not this film succeeds or fails in your eyes, I think, depends on how much you can get behind the performances. And uh, at Brooklyn Horror Film Fest uh, last October, you know, I was lucky enough to catch a film called Kill Your Lover, which really relies on two lead performances. There are some other people in the movie, but it really is a movie about two people and their relationship together. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great to get the writers and director team of that movie on this episode to talk about the caller with us? So Alex Austin and Keir Seward, uh, who made Kill Your Lover from last year, are here to just discuss the caller and i'm super excited to see you guys again how's it going thank you for joining us really good thank you thank you for having us thanks for having us and uh great pronunciation of my name <laughs> yes <laughs> we ran drills yeah yeah it was, very, it was an intensive <laughs> process no we're excited to have you guys here and uh excited that you were willing to take a gamble on this movie because Sometimes we ask people to pick a movie that's near and dear to their heart. Sometimes we ask people to kind of take a flyer and see where it lands. I have a hard time believing this is a movie that is near and dear to anybody's heart, not because it's particularly bad, but because it, this is a hard to find movie. Uh, and it's kind of always been hard to find. It's really a bit of a strange mm -hmm. anomaly. Um, but I'm excited to dig into this one because there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with The Caller. There sure is. And Alex and Kier, I kind of threw a Hail Mary saying, you know, here's a movie, uh, a hard to find little scene movie from Empire Pictures that is really about just two characters. And uh, I guess you could say a relationship, but I, you know what, I'm going to go off script here. Not that I ever really have a script, <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to say something we don't usually say on this show. We tend to go through these films, which are pretty old most of them i mean we do hit some of the newer full moon stuff but yeah. i'm gonna say for this one we 100 percent will spoil this movie so if you've never seen the caller and you're like oh i wonder what that is and you're not able to watch the episode in preparation for the show and form your own thoughts and ideas about it and you're we're hoping to go off a recommendation from us i will say pause this episode and go watch the caller before you listen to the episode, because as we discuss it, we are going to spoil any potential uh, plot twists or uh, beats that the movie narrative beats that the movie might have. And, and I haven't really there's a, felt there's a doozy compelled of one. to do that. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a doozy of a twist in this one, I would say. <laughs> yeah, a bit of an unusual one. Yeah. Well, and so when, when, oh, you, when, oh, sorry, when you suggested this film, like it definitely once we finished watching it i was like oh yeah it's some it was like a weird dark twin or distant relative to our movie in in some strange ways um maybe not so much with the twist but watching it we were like oh yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah, you, i'm i'm glad familiar. because i i saw those characteristics of the movie and i suggested it to you guys now kill your lover is a really fun body horror relationship movie i think when i saw it i think maybe alex i said to you when i was speaking to you after the screening that it kind of reminded me of like 
possession with Mortal Kombat fatalities. <laughs> Ooh, I like that idea. Not not inaccurate. <laughs> well, I think I think the in- interesting thing for this podcast is to say that we we actually were like quite inspired a bit by too by like say Reanimator and from beyond mm-hmm. sort of like Stuart Gordon's work. Um, which like one of the 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 best moments was uh, Barbara Crampton came to the screening at uh, Overlook and oh. uh, told me Stuart, Stuart Gordon would have loved the movie, which was like made me so happy. Like made I can't even year. tell you, that. I was like like beaming for the rest of the day. Made oh, your year in April. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm That's sorry great. to say that nothing I can say to you on this podcast is going to compare to that. So we can just kind of <laughs> hang it up. I think. That's all right. You complimented the pacing of the film, which will make us forever happy. Well, and and this is uh, we're, we're starting early with tangents, but I remember <laughs> I had just recently before that, but because this was October, because it was Brooklyn Horror Year movie open the festival, which was awesome, because I I didn't really know anything about it. I bought one of the badges for I forget like six movies or something like that, which I like to do each year. And Nighthawk in Prospect Park, where that one was, is really close to my apartment. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the opening night movie. I don't know anything about it. I'm just going to go in blind. A friend of mine from work came with me and I just loved it. I went in with no expectations and was like, wow, that was so much fun. And it was amazing because, you know, there is sort of a possession element or otherworldly element uh, to the to the movie also. And I had just recently seen Exorcist Believer. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, wow, your movie the pacing was was something that worked in its favor. And I was still trying to get the taste of Exorcist Believer out of my mouth <laughs> <laughs> see, seeing that movie. But uh, here yeah, you mentioned the Stuart good. Gordon stuff and it that's that's amazing because I definitely see the influences there. So some people we have on the show, like I was saying, kind of throwing a Hail Mary here. They're not big empire or full moon heads, but your movie is like a possession body horror movie. So where did the your love of horror, and this question goes to both of you, however you want to answer it, uh, where did your love of like horror movies and low budget stuff and practical effects and all of that really start for you? Well, I think it's kind of an interesting one because I do think that we came into this in very sort of like different ways. I mean, I I grew up really with like a dad who showed me like a lot of like 50s B movies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I really liked, you know, sort of things like The Fiend Without a Face and, uh, you know, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. And, you know, I just watched a lot of that sort of stuff. But then also was like really taken by stuff like The Day the Earth Stood Still, like, you know, things that were a little bit more like meaty. Um, and then kind of as I got older, I started getting, you know, I my, sort of my life changing experience was watching The Thing, mm. which was like a movie that like the, the VHS cover, like just fascinated me because I grew up in New Mexico. John Carpenter was filming vampires at the time. And so like that name, John Carpenter, just kind of like really like hung with me. And uh, I was like mesmerized by the VHS box of the thing. And then when I finally saw it, when I was 14, it started my kind of love affair, both with John Carpenter and Kurt Russell. Um, and I actually have a giant tattoo of the thing on my arm now. Um, and then just like, you know, (laughs) I think that that kind of segued me into Cronenberg. And then, you know, I remember watching reanimator late night on TV and like, once we'd moved to Scotland, like there were all these movie channels that my grandparents had and they were showing reanimator at like 11 o'clock at night. And I watched that and 11 o'clock at night is the perfect time to watch reanimator. And so I think I just you know, became more and more fascinated by like practical effects and stuff like that. But um, Alex has a very different kind of like, yeah, you have a different story. Um, I think the funny thing is like, I didn't uh, appreciate the full spectrum of horror, I don't think, until I was in my early 20s, which surprise, surprise is when I met Keir. Um, So, you know, the education started off slower and then gathered steam over time. And um, yeah, I think he really introduced me to having like a a greater appreciation and I'm very much a practical effects gal now, now that I can appreciate it as art rather than it, like it used to guts in particular used to affect me so much. I was like, I can do blood, but I can't do guts. Mm. I can do Sweeney Todd, but I can't do, I don't know, saw. Uh, that has very much changed because I'm like, ooh, look at it. It's so well, well, that's good. You can watch City of the Living Dead now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but before that, it's like, you know, it's very easy to 
kind of like, I guess, put horror in a box. Um, and so I'm really glad that that's no longer the case. But even though I thought, oh, well, all horror movies are like slashes and ghost movies, which I just wasn't so interested in. Um, you know, it took me some time to realize that I was actually a very morbid child because I was watching, you know, anime and reading manga that I shouldn't have been reading at 13. And I watched Perfect Blue when I was 13. And I was like, deeply, deeply disturbing stuff. And like, obviously loved Silence of the Lambs, but it was okay to like that because it was a thriller oh. in quotation marks. And so it's like that thing where, yeah, it's funny how, you know, gradually you get, you know, uh, distorted and um, brought to the dark side. And, you know, now that I'm here, I'm like, yeah, I just want to convert more people, to be honest, because it's really fun over here. Well, it's, it's funny, too, because it's like at, at first you were kind of like, I'm kind of OK with the prestige, more kind of like high. And then I just kept like pulling your like levels down <laughs> further and further to the. To, yeah, to... once we hit the pandemic, we were like, right. It's like all of all of the all of the sores, all of the everything. It watched was, all the Friday the Thirteenth movies, and yeah. like, especially after the first three, you were like, "Does anything different happen in any of these movies?" I'm like, "It gets weirder." I it promise. didn't. It didn't matter. Like you got into the yeah, you just yeah, yeah. very much started enjoying watching all of the seat like the seat like the whole series back to back. Yeah. I guess. yeah. And, um, kind of going deciding who our favorite people were. So I'm a Chucky gal. Yeah, oh, I'm. I'm cool. Jason, Jason's my my boy. I love Jason, and then Alex is Chucky, you know. But we managed to make it work. Yes, this somehow, somehow, it's oil and water over there. But uh, yes. yeah, it's the yeah. Hatfields and the McCoys. I <laughs> I feel like, and I I can appreciate that because I'm a I'm a Friday guy in a lot of ways too. But I, I have revisited, or actually visited for the first time. As Child's Play was a series, I kind of I watched the first maybe two or three child's plays and i was kind of like all right i'm good like when i was younger and then they started becoming gradually more weird you know and don <laughs> mancini was started taking some bigger swings with some of this stuff and i avoided them because i remember thinking that i wasn't going to like the tone of bride of chucky or seed of chucky or any of those and then those even change to the point where i kind of feel like the series has an interesting baseline of quality Mm -hmm. Where they're they're all even Child's Play three, which is probably the worst one, is still watchable. Yeah, I think I think the whole personally, I think the whole thing is pretty legit actually by comparison to most other franchises. Well, I'd even be the like, first very to say varied. I'd yeah. be the first to even admit that I'm like I'm not sure that individually you could say that a single Friday the Thirteenth movie is actually a good movie. It's just I. I'm here for Jason. I'm here for the whole experience. I'm like, I'll, I'll take the ride, you know, wherever he wants to go. Even yeah. If it's in space. But it's like, but I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to try and claim they're great movies, but I actually think you could make a case that all of the Chucky movies are actually pretty good movies. I would do the same for, uh, th this is why, like, I think I prefer the iconography of Jason. I love looking at Jason. I love his design and I love like the kills and everything that they set up. But yeah, I will agree. Like there is no one single movie that I would put over, say like Nightmare on Elm Street 3, you know, where, where I, I think the Freddy movies are genuinely like very high benchmarks of quality compared to what's going on with Jason, which are just kind of great prurient little thrills. You know, Jason is so much of an amusement park kind of series. Right. I just love Jason. I want to give him a cuddle. I think he needs a cuddle. And I, I think, think I can fix him everything. is the thing. Yeah, yeah I think I can. Yeah. I, I personally don't think people talk about I know what you did last summer enough. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I do like that first one a lot. Yeah. I like Ross that movie Jack in Black in the second movie, maybe less so, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're totally right. No, I, I you're you're right. And I, I feel about Halloween. Like Halloween, the, the original John Carpenter Halloween might actually be my favorite movie of all time because it was probably the first horror movie that really affected me the way it was supposed to like yeah. i watched them when i was younger for like titillation and thrills to see things i wasn't supposed to see but it was the first movie that actually really worked as a horror movie on me and i would go so far as to say that movie and halloween 3 are good and there's not another single good halloween movie i would agree yeah 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 I, sorry I, listeners I, put your angry tweets down <laughs> i think that's it is though like when you have a film like that that affects you in that kind of way it doesn't matter really like what other people's opinions are i think just because something is your favorite movie doesn't mean that you're saying it's the best movie and i think no. there's like 
a lot to say about yeah. that, but yeah, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's let's switch gears let's and talk it. a little bit about The Caller, uh, because this is a very interesting film. Uh, the Caller was released December 27th, 1989. It's directed by Arthur Allen Seidelman, and it's written by Michael Sloan, and it stars Malcolm McDowell and Madeline Smith. That is the whole cast. So this is yet another col- uh, casualty of the Empire collapse. We talk about this a lot. Empire Films filed for bankruptcy in 1988, and by 1989, all of their stuff was being sold off. Most of it wound up going to MGM. A few of the stragglers were sold off to some kind of small uh, video-only production companies. The Caller was one of those. Um, this one was actually finished in 1986. It showed at Cannes in 1987. I don't think it showed in competition. It was probably like in the basement film market, you know, where <laughs> Charles Band likes to hang out. But it did uh, show at Cannes in 1987. Uh, and then it got shelved uh, until Empire went under. It finally got a home video release through Transworld releasing in December of 1989. But it went largely unseen. It's no longer streaming anywhere. We had to find a copy on YouTube. Uh, my copy had some lovely um, uh, Portuguese subtitles on there. So I think I learned a lot. It's a very beautiful language. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was a small DVD run of Vinegar Syndrome uh, reprints. Uh, that you could probably track down if you wanted a physical copy of it. But it's kind of a hard movie to find. And it's a really unique movie for Empire Films. All right, so Empire is not a company that traditionally relies on A, performances, and B, dialogue. And this is a movie that is really pushing its chips all in on both. Um, both to its uh, uh, benefit and to its detriment, I would argue, because sometimes when it goes in a more empire direction, these elements feel a little more incongruous. But this is uh, probably the only Empire slash Full Moon film that you could point out and say, oh yeah, this could be a stage play. Like you could change this into a stage play without really having to change much. It's two actors, it's a single location for the most part, and it's entirely dialogue driven. Now, me personally, I, I love a good filmed play. I don't know why, I've just always loved a good filmed play. I think there's something really engaging about it. And I'm also somebody who likes to have movies on in the background, you know? And so like something with that's really dialogue heavy with really excellent performances like going on in the background that I don't necessarily need to be like visually wrapped up in. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot to that for some. Oh, like that's me. why I always hear Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross in the background mm. when we're recording. Look, You're you like, need to know that you need to always be closing. You need to always be closing. <laughs> um, I'm saying it all the time. Well, um, one th- thing th- that Steve, is what oh, this sorry, is. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I you were just saying you enjoy stay, um, filmed plays essentially. And that really is like, I, I made sort of a little comment about a pinter play in my, introduction to the movie and that's really what it rings like to me yeah but i this movie is very unique for empire but i do feel like it sort of signifies you know we're past like vicious lips and we're past the first ghoulies yeah we're even past from beyond and reanimator at this point and i i think there is a slight shift in direction when we get a yablons involved yeah, and this time we have Frank Yablons as opposed to Erwin Yablons on prison, and I think that you know Frank Yablons, having been like the president of Paramount at one time, had grander ambitions, and I feel like this and prison both are like these attempts to legitimize and transcend genre yeah. into something that is a little more prestige feeling and they just have the misfortune of being made at the time when the empire collapse was imminent. Right. Because I look back at some of these later empire movies that were made at this time, like this movie and prison and robot jocks and ghost town. And it's like, these are good, yeah. but they virtually became like impossible to find yeah. because they were all sold off to other companies and it took them a long time to find distribution and it's unfortunate because i do feel like there's kind of this second wave golden era of empire stuff like we talked about how how we love the arrow video empire of screams box set and how we wish there were more volumes of it with some of these movies like i would like one with the caller and prison and ghost town 
and maybe another one of these kind of later uh, empire pictures in there as well, because yeah. I just think it's such a shame that they, that, cause this is a modestly budgeted movie, but kind of high for an empire movie. This is a $4 million budget. That's surprisingly high for uh, like how little they're actually doing, but, but maybe you're absolutely right there. There are these, I like that? the actors might have had to do with, I mean, Malcolm McDowell probably yeah. had some kind of quote at that time. He, you know, he probably, know. yeah. He's he's bringing a little bit of uh, prestige heat. And that's kind of where Empire is at at this time, too. Like, where when this movie's being shot, like, Empire is kind of at the height of their power. And Charles Band has always kind of wanted to flirt with legitimacy, quote unquote. Like, he wanted movies, his movies to be taken seriously. Some of that may have been fueled by competition. I think it was 1985 that Canon Films released uh, Runaway Train which got a surprise best picture nomination, you know, like, so it's like, Oh my God, Canon films is getting Oscar nominations. Why can't empire? Like, why can't we put out something prestigious and something different? And I feel like that's what they were going for uh, here in an interesting way. And uh, the cool thing about having a very small cast here is that we get to talk about uh, the entire cast here in a little bit of detail. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, launch in with uh, Malcolm McDowell, British uh, stage and screen legend. He's got more than, close to 300 film credits at this point. Um, and I was realizing when I was watching this, like, I don't think I've seen Malcolm McDowell in the eighties uh, because he's in this transitional period where he's still like a little baby faced, but he's getting the gray hair going on. So he's not quite full. He, he would really embrace the gray hair, craggy face, villain aesthetic in the nineties and uh, up to present day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing him in the eighties uh, and even looking at his filmography, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a, fairly fallow period for him uh relatively well, considering he's a guy who usually does like a dozen movies a year well he was trying to recover from the disaster that was caligula that's true yeah like, yeah he was caligula happened and he didn't work for a while i think that's the interesting thing about malcolm mcdowell too is he has this kind of weird status where he kind of fluctuates between high and lowbrow art in terms of how you perceive him because even when it say something like, if you think about like um, the highbrow kind of like important films that he's done, they're still like transgressive or edgy, like A Clockwork Orange or If or Caligula. Like they have those kind of elements to them where there's a prestige element, but there's also a kind of trashy or kind of, um, you know, edgy kind of quality to them. And then I think it's that thing where he's in this weird place where he's kind of a B movie. He feels like a B movie actor in a movie sort of like productions. And then I think at certain points he just became a guy who liked the money will show up. If you pay him money, he'll show up. It's like, it's like the, like one of the weirdest ones I always think about is like him being the principal in easy a, yeah. You're just kind of like, yeah. why the hell is Malcolm McDowell the principal of like a Southern California school? Like it just, yeah. and, he's, he's, and he just sounds and looks like Malcolm McDowell. This doesn't really make any sense. And he's like, he's good in that. Like he's funny in that movie. And he, he, uh, he really is a guy who's like, he could be very precious with his career, but he's just kind of not, you know, he, there's something about it. Like it doesn't feel like he's taking paycheck roles. It just feels like he likes to work a lot. And, uh, and is just not shy about what kind of movies he's going to be making. He feels few, like he picks up all the roles that Terrence Stamp turns down. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Terrence yeah, Stamp the, would be a little bit more precious about it. And he's like, nope, I'm in. I got this. Yeah. Um, no, you're you're right. But he's very good in, if you've ever seen Nicholas Meyer's Time After Time, mm, where he no, plays he plays H.G. Wells, um, like the Jack the Ripper movie, which which is quite good. Um, and yeah, I think I've heard that, people go to bat for that movie. I've never seen it. Yeah, I got Mary Steenburgen, uh, I think a Oscar nom, or maybe even a no, not a win, I don't think, but I think a no, nom. She won for, she Melvin, won for and Melvin and Howard. Melvin and yeah. Howard, yeah. she won for it, yeah. And then David Warner plays Jack the Ripper in it. That's yeah. it. Okay, yeah, I remember no, it's David good movie. Warner. Yeah. Um, and he was actually married in Mary Steenburgen for like all of the 80s, I think. Um, they, they got divorced and then she got with Ted Danson. They've been together ever since, but. Um, which is interesting. They have a son now who is a filmmaker that looks like the exact, like sometimes like one, a child will look more like one parent or another. He looks like the exact confluence of the two of them in a very weird way, uh, which is not a combination you would think of. Like one is very like sweet and wide eyed and pretty and the other is kind of intense and villainous looking. And it, it makes for an interesting looking kid. 
Um, and then our other star here is Madeline Smith, who I was not familiar with uh, directly. Uh, she is one of those actresses who kind of popped up in a lot of things I've seen, but is usually in a smaller role or didn't necessarily pop. And it's also she's she retired in 1994. So she hasn't been like fresh in my mind for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but she probably broke her, her biggest breakout was in 1980 was a, she had a large supporting role in Urban Cowboy, which was a big old hit. Um, and then she also got critical praise for her roles in uh, All of Me uh, and uh, 2010 and Funny Farm. You know, she worked very steadily. Um, after this, it was mostly TV roles. Uh, she married an NHL player named Mark Osborne in 1988. And in 1994, she retired from acting completely so she could focus on raising her family. Um, but yeah, it's, she is the the other half of the duo here. And I, I'm curious what you all think about these performances um because i i think mcdowell is pretty locked in i think he he seems to understand what he's going for i i think madeline smith struggles a little bit with the material and i don't think it's her fault i think the material is asking her to play a lot of stuff very close to the chest in a way that i think often leaves her a little lost you know like i'm i'm an actor you guys have worked with actors before you know that like one of the strongest things you need to build a character is a strong want, right? You need a you need a need. You need something that this character wants and is working towards. I think I was always a little struggling to figure out what it was that she was getting at. And that's just kind of due to the nature of the script. Like we're not supposed to know if we're supposed to trust her or not, you know? It's 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 a kind of weird one, I think, because it's that sort of strange thing of it's very hard. Like like when you when I when I was watching it for like the first hour, it's just kind of like everything feels slightly off and weird, and yeah. then you get to that point where obviously the twist happens, and you go, so was the first hour meant to feel off and weird, or was that something that was a byproduct of? the performances or the mm -hmm. direction or something like that that was unintentional and it's it's kind of like in retrospect it weirdly makes some of it work a lot better for me than when mm. i initially watched it but it's kind of hard for me to almost judge the performance because it's kind of weird for me to once i know the context of everything it starts to make some level of sense yeah i would say that like I, a lot of what i like noted for myself was like she did seem oddly calm in moments. Yeah. And so I was like, huh, I wonder what's going on here. And then like, as things go along, like obviously you keep trying to find different explanations for why either of them are acting the way they are very early on. And maybe this just like, is me showing my cards a little bit too much, but I was like, is this just some weird kinky role-playing thing that they're doing? Like, right. You know, is this just like a some really long foreplay or something? Um, like I kept coming back to that quite a lot because both of them seemed quite knowing, and I know that some of that, and I think that that does it does make yeah. sense in retrospect, obviously with a very different spin. But um, yeah, it's like I, I think what obviously neither of us knew the uh, setting um, going into this, so I don't know if either of you knew ahead of time. Um, no. I'm assuming Jared, you'd seen it before. I had seen this movie once before, okay. and I have to say, it was really, really hard for me to have any conversation with Steve off mic where I didn't oh. say what the premise of the movie was or what mm -hmm. the conceit of the movie was. I was just kind of like, "All right, well, yep, it's uh, it's Malcolm McDowell and Madeline <laughs> Smith. It's two actors. Uh, enjoy, like, yeah, 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 because <laughs> yeah, it's kind of at like the more you like describe the plot the more you kind of risk giving things away really the 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 core of this is just that it's these two people who come together like she lives in this cabin he uh claims to have uh broken down and needs to use her phone and then it's just a lot of weird like power dynamic stuff yeah. between the two of them it's kind of a cat and mouse thing going on it's super interesting how they decide to set her up as well because i was like why are we spending so much time with her literally traveling from the shop to i was sort of saying to you oh it's a bit of shoe leather all this kind of thing but it's so that they give us enough time to get used to her as seemingly a normal woman mm -hmm. and then they reveal the hat box so you're like oh there's some weirdness here what's going on with that and then you kind of go well is she like a murderess and he's actually in danger and so there's some like interesting dynamics going on there um i think sometimes 
her stakes weren't as clear as I think they could have been like throughout like it it felt like she needed to either be on one side or the other right so much easier feels so peculiar that and it's like that weird thing of because and I, and I think this is where say like the empire you know or you know the the full moon charles band association um starts to work against the movie because i'm starting to go is is everything weird because they're incompetent or is everything feel weird because that's intentional so yeah. it's like that weird thing of when they're sort of setting up or doing things i'm like is that just badly written or is that actually supposed to mean something and so it's like that weird thing in retrospect again having sort of like finished it i then go maybe all of that was intentional but while i was watching i'm like is this because this is bad or is this what i'm supposed to be getting out of it Right. It's it's one of those things where the performance that Madeline Smith is giving needs to be like a little more imperious, I think, a little more, um, you know, a little more distanced. She's very emotional. She's very invested in the conversations that she's having. And she she's um, but but it's it's vacillating a lot and seemingly kind of uh, randomly. But it never it, seems it, it really intense is. enough for her to be a killer. Like, yeah. I feel like it feels ingenuine when that kind of is first idea is first introduced. Well, there's a lot of it, too, that feels kind of oddly. It's got a very TV director feel to it in the it sense does. that it, it has these very kind of blocked out scenes. And when you say that it's like a play, it has this kind of feeling of everyone is just they've rehearsed the scene and everyone's saying the dialogue. But there's not a point where like this line is supposed to mean something or trigger this thing. You can see how in it's written, there's like a point that's supposed to like there'll be a line or there'll be a thing that's supposed to kind of like go, ooh, that's an interesting point. Is that tense? But it doesn't linger on anything. They just kind of continue to say the dialogue in these kind of very sort of straightforward coverage shots with nothing really being and it, this might also be because they were shooting on a, on a on a on a shorter time period or kind of like a compressed scale. But it's just it feels very much like uh, the director is doing a very kind of like functional job without really kind of like and especially if it's a two hander and it's all dialogue. You need to have a point where you're thinking, how are we emphasizing certain things in the in the dialogue, or emphasizing certain things in the scene rather than just filming all of the dialogue and coverage? Yeah, exactly. And this director, we should mention uh, Alan Arthur Seidelman, he uh, a very respected uh, theater director, very accomplished TV director. As a filmmaker, he's probably a little shakier. Uh, really, he's got a lot of movies that he directed, most of which are little indies that mo nobody's seen or have been lost to time. Uh, but his big debut was 1969's Hercules in New York, which gave us <clears throat> Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, and if you haven't seen that movie, oh boy, holy shit, check out that movie. It it's, is, a, uh, it's a hoot. It is a hoot. It is a hoot. If you want to hear Arnold Schwarzenegger very poorly dubbed, look at my <laughs> muscles. <laughs> like they and they changed his name to Arnold Strong, I think, because they they knew that no one could pronounce that name. <laughs> you know, so it, it's he's he's kind of uh, uh, it's a weird dichotomy because there's a guy who's a very respected theater director, but he's working in a medium that he has not really shown a lot of proficiency in. But he is also doing essentially a play. And it's very little the, room to hide anywhere. I think, yeah, I think the it. strangest thing, one of the things that really struck me is that I wouldn't normally say this about a film, but given the way that the trajectory was going, like they were starting to build some tension, you know, uh, on, on that first night, right, when he arrives, like, okay, so she's spilled the oil and stuff's starting to go down and she sees that she doesn't have the bullets in the gun anymore. And then it just cuts to the next day. Yeah. And I'm like, what just happened? And so I wouldn't normally say this, but I was like, maybe this should have all been like one, one day, one night. Like yeah, it, was, it, yeah. it seemed like a very strange choice because it, for me, it broke all of what tension there was. It broke the tension quite a lot. And I was like, wait, now I don't know where I am. And maybe that was like intentional to be like, oh, jarring. But it, maybe it was jarring. It was jarring. All right. Jarring. But I, I think you're yeah. absolutely right. I think this needs to be like uh, as real time as we can make it. Like, yeah, make yeah. make it just this t really tense encounter that like is going on way too long um, over the course of a single night. And then the stakes can escalate from there because it does deflate it a little bit when it's like, 
oh, we're going to go for a drive in the countryside. Oh, uh, we're going to have like a romantic tension all of a sudden. You know, we have we have days with each other to get to know each other. And and that's just kind of an odd dichotomy. Um, you know, so this cabin least, in the woods is located in Italy. Who knew? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, you have a lot of weird stuff like that where when like it needs to be kind of a gradually increasing tension. And what we have here is kind of stops and starts, you know, it's like the tension will build, the power will be moving in one direction, then it'll suddenly go away and then it'll shift back to another person. And then, but it never doesn't feel like McDowell is in charge, despite all the attempts that they're making to kind of shift it up. It never doesn't feel like he's in the power position to me. It kind of falls into what I think is a kind of um, thing you see a lot with kind of like very like sort of like first time filmmakers and sort of like early scripts where essentially the entire thing is premised on a twist. So it's almost like they say everything in the first hour doesn't actually matter that much because it's all going to get explained by the twist, Yeah, which the twist itself doesn't actually explain anything really that happens previously in the (laughs) film. It just kind of, there's an element to it where it feels like it's wasting time for an hour just to get to the eventual conclusion, but that eventual conclusion doesn't really supplement anything that's happened previously. And I I do wonder if like that whole bit of the car and the, this and the, that was like sort of added later or shot later. And they were like, we need to make this longer because it's not long enough as it is because again the oil spill comes back at the end Mm -hmm. but you're kind of like okay but it's been several days so did you not think to clean that up yeah you know they're very like odd stuff that i it feels like was left hanging rather than it actually meaning anything and so it's like that thing where oh so i don't have any bullets in my gun well then if you're able to just escape him why wouldn't you just go buy more bullets like You have access to a store. It It was a very strange inclusion. The one thing I will say, speaking quickly to the power dynamic, is like early on, you don't know. I guess the only thing that she has over him is, especially when you don't know what's going on yet, you kind of just go, oh, wow, she seems kind of crazy and that she could go completely batshit on him. And there's obviously, the again, the bit before the break, I'm going to call it the break, um, where she says to him, no, you have to wait outside. And then she's suddenly like, oh, well, actually, no, come back inside. And obviously at the time I didn't know what was going on, but I do remember kind of going, why would she bring him back inside after she's been able to do that? And I was like, oh, well, maybe she's decided, I don't know, to make him a human sacrifice or something like that to add him to her murder count because obviously at that point we think, something's in the hat box yeah he's actually in more danger so that was probably the last real time that i thought she had any power over him so i did think you know she might be more nuts than we're giving her credit for yeah well, it's interesting because if you because the thing that i was kind of thinking about you know by the end of it is do you remember if you do you guys watch black mirror mm-hmm. yeah so do you know the the episode White Bear? That's the mm-hmm. one about the woman in the woods who and everyone's like walking around, like filming her with the cameras. It's like, that's one where you're like, you're treated to the first two thirds of that is just pure weirdness with very little kind of like for you to grasp onto. But when you get to the third act, all of those elements kind of come round and it's like a domino effect where it's like, okay, all of those things that you set up now mean something. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of, where some of my frustration ultimately came from. I'm kind of like things like setting up the hat box, the cake, all of these kind of like weird things of the doll in the cupboard, all of that. They don't actually really mean much of anything at the end other than just kind of like, oh, well, this person's just being vaguely fucked with in some kind of a way. And I did find myself wondering what the fuck is in that cake? Because like that's that's producing that kind of blood thing coming out of the bottom. It's a pasty Victoria sponge. I mean, to me, like, that you actually said that is the funniest at thing about it. At the very beginning, like, I was like, <laughs> I think it's a cake. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a very safe cake. Um, that being said, though, I mean, I agree with you for the most part that there was a lot of, you know, stuff for the sake of stuff. But when it came to the cake, I personally felt like it did read as, well, she's hopeful that she's going to be able to reunite with her daughter. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah. That's so fair she's enough. got a little cake because she's like, I'm going to do it this time. Yeah. So, 
I, I disagree. With you. I, I would say <laughs> I would say that I mean because the thing is like I'm actually like I feel like we're coming over very negative. I actually didn't dislike this movie. No, I didn't um, either. It, uh, it, it, it's it, flawed, but I liked it quite a bit. I like also. I like it's that it's a swing. It has yeah. its yeah. own weird energy to it, and I think that as I said, the, the the one thing that the twist does do is make all of the off energy of the first part of it actually feel like it makes some kind of contextual sense because these are both people who are behaving strangely for very specific reasons but it's it's that kind of weird thing the best thing that i can say about it is i can imagine it's the sort of film that when i was a teenager i might have caught on like randomly on some channel at like like one in the morning and watched and then kind of spent the next 20 years going was that a real movie or did i just dream mm. that yeah it has kind of <laughs> that this energy. a fever dream <laughs> i mean yeah. a, a really good companion piece to this or maybe like a good exemplar of how this is this this kind of idea could be done is the film sleuth with Laurence olivier mm. and michael kane speaking of pinter i think pinter wrote the remake of that which you can skip but um but sleuth is a movie with just two characters where you're not supposed to fully trust either one of them and it's constantly finding ways to kind of pull the rug out from under you whereas this one you get to the end of it I, okay, I think we need to just talk about this uh, this this twist ending here because this sort of is the, before, the meat of it. Before yeah. we do, Steve, I just want to say I want to uh, here mention Black Mirror, and I thought to myself watching this, this is a flawed movie that could have been, uh, like Alex mentioned before, if you take that uh, middle segment out, and this is just a one night in the house type thing, could have been an excellent um you know black mirror or hour long twilight zone yeah episode as opposed to a 96 minute movie but also the way you're talking about how the the twist and the reveal of the twist make some of the cho earlier choices or things that seem odd make sense i don't want to say that i think this movie i'm not holding this movie in the same regard as mulholland drive but it reminds me of how when you watch Mulholland Drive for the first time, and that was a movie that I introduced to a lot of people, the way that Naomi Watts delivers lines early in that movie is so stilted and over the top right. and weird that I remember multiple people I was watching the movie with who I showed it to for the first time looked at me kind of crossed like side eyed or said to me like, what's up with the acting in this movie? Because it's, you don't realize that what she's actually doing is this layered performance of a phony persona of a washed up uh, person and that she's creating an alter ego as this like is going on. And it, and then it once you kind of put the pieces together and you get a sense of what that movie is about and being Lynch, it could be about different things to different people. Those choices make make sense. And so I just wanted to highlight, like you were saying before, Kier, like it's, yeah, sometimes in the beginning, it was hard to tell what is intentionality and what is sort of just like, okay, well, this is as brooding as I can be. This is as intense as I can be. This is how I how I can deliver these lines. Like what is sort of a um, unemotional line reading versus an intentional line reading. And I think it makes a little more sense once the twist that Steve will reveal now is... <laughs> is prevented to us or given and, to us, I should say at the end, presented to us at the end. And for me, I was kind of like, all right, this explains some things. And it also opens up a whole lot of other questions for me that this movie's not prepared to answer, but Agreed. we, we should. Re okay. So if you're not interested in listening to the twist, you can stop now, go watch the movie, come back ready to uh, ready to listen to us. But the big reveal at the end of this movie is that Malcolm McDowell is a robot who has been, and correct me if I'm missing some of the details on here, who who has been holding Madeline Smith hostage in some kind of experiment, like basically like a never-ending escape room where her job is to poke logical holes in the story that he's telling her, and if she gets enough things right, then she'll gain 50 points and she'll get to go home. But the ultimate like kind of Harlan Ellison-esque like twist at the end of this one is that there is no way for her to get 50 points. She's stuck in this kind of eternal purgatory replaying this scenario over and over because it doesn't uh, stop them yeah because they they want to retrain the children is the main thing from what i gathered right and yeah. it's not her chosen specifically there are thousands of them yes yeah i think what you you said 
probably explained it better to me than the film did because it's that thing of like the film gets a very expositiony towards the end where you really do it's that thing where you feel like someone starts explaining a movie to you and you're just kind of like i you know it'd be nice if some of this is done in a visual fashion yeah, or some sure, kind of like tell. but you have that kind of like cheap low budget cabin in the woods where it's kind of like and it's um I always think of this as like things students uh, do where they kind of go like, we're gonna have two people on a bench explain a movie to you that could, oh, I'm actually the devil and I'm actually, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm actually a trap soul and I'm going to explain to you how mm -hmm. all of these interesting things are happening, but actually we're just two people talking on a bench. You know, yeah, that's what yeah but, and look, in, in some ways this twist reveal does kind of help uh, alleviate some of the weirdness from earlier in the movie. You know, there is this constant sense that uh, these two characters have known each other for a long time. You know, that's kind of built into it from the beginning. But I was just a little thrown by like, okay, she knows she's in an experiment and she's just in character this entire time. This is her acting. Like it's basically just a never ending like improv scene that she has to do with Malcolm McDowell. When I was I was trying to figure out too if it was having a bit of a cabin in the woods type you know meta thing where she's like so I've got to go into the shower and he can like stalk me while I'm like showering and getting you know and and doing the sort of like the horror heroine kind of thing yeah um, and then I I have to play act the character of the movie but it it doesn't feel like it it feels like if that is a theme it's a sort of half thought out theme and i think that's where a lot of this a lot of this feels a bit like a first draft yeah yeah it, it's it, it's definitely an audacious swing and we get some really fun uh visual effects from john carl beekler towards the end of this movie as mcdowell gets his face kind of half ripped off and he does a lot of good uh electrocution acting <laughs> um but then, you know, the reveal is that, of course, that was just one Malcolm McDowell bot and there are there are a ton of them and it's replaceable and you can keep kind of bringing them in forever. And it's just they're going to endlessly torture this woman. And I just I was never fully clear what their goal was. I was never fully clear like what like is this a uh, an alien planet or something that they she's been harvested to? Is this like a commune like in the village or something where, where they're just isolated from the world and they can keep doing these weird little experiments for all time. So like well, I, it, it answers I, one thing and then uh, raises a million. Yeah. Things up. You know, like the, yeah. I mean, it raises a lot of questions definitely. And so I think it's been, it relies, the whole movie relies on you doing a lot of mind games with yourself basically, mm -hmm. which I must say after about an hour gets quite exhausting. So I was like, you know what? I just want to know the twist now. Like I know that there's a twist yeah. and I can't keep up with what's important. Like, they weren't giving enough significance to certain things to lead you down a specific path. It was just letting you do lots of busy work. So then it, the ending kind of leaves you with that as well. So you could read loads into it and, you know, have at you. And maybe that's really fun to some people. But if you really start poking holes in it, you're like, okay, but like, where's the rest of it? So what, what I, this is just my interpretation, obviously, but from what I gathered, I feel like Earth has been taken over by these robot beings or an alien race maybe that have these robot beings and they're just keeping the adults busy basically while they train up the kids um, and like essentially assimilate the kids because they're like more influenceable I guess and in the meantime they're doing es essentially studies on the adults and like seeing what they can do but the whole point system in particular you're like okay but like what was that oh wait well we've moved, we've moved on to something else when, they're like oh wasn't that a fun thing and now let's talk about this sci-fi concept well and alex you poked some holes in that story just... so you are awarded 10 points mm -hmm. <laughs> well and i think that's kind of the problem because ultimately you know the twist is really you know we can call it whatever we want she's in purgatory and it's it's that's kind mm -hmm. of the problem with a lot of these types of narratives where essentially it relies on some kind of sense of, okay, yeah, she's just uh, in a never ending loop of badness. She's in purgatory. And you can come up with as many little like slight specifics to try and be like, yes, but it's purgatory, but it's robots and it's all of this, but it doesn't mean anything because none of that is really sort of like actually building off anything in the narrative. I was thinking actually the good counter example of something that works like that is moon 
So yeah. if like looking at something like Moon, that's a movie that sets up these questions that then build towards a reveal that means something and ultimately has an emotional, you know, sort of end for that lead character, you know, and you know, it, it's not just a kind of like, eh, none of it, none of it mattered. It was all just kind of like he was just in a bad place and that's it. So, you know, it's like it all it sets up these questions, but has a payoff when the twist happens. Yeah, yeah. it just needed. Well, it just it needed to be better written. Well, um, things like this have worked in the past. I think there's, yeah. there's just an element to which they were they were striving for something. They tried something. We were willing it to be what we would have liked it to be, but it didn't pay off a lot of the things that it was setting up you, it's like you just threw a lot of stuff at the wall right you you could argue that there's like a metaphorical angle you can look at here like th this is all about the creative process you know mcdowell is the relentless creator trying to work out the kinks in his project while madeline smith is the actor and she's just forced to keep enduring it as everything keeps changing and changing but you know for for a figurative approach like that to work you also need to make some like logical sense as a narrative, you know, and uh, it, it's not fully satisfying unless you can connect those two threads in a way. I think uh, it needs meat on the bone ultimately. It does. And I think that's, that's the really interesting thing, you know, as uh, by comparing it to say a lot of other kind of like empire full moon kind of stuff where you're kind of like, well, this is so kind of, cheap and silly that I can just because and it's its goal is pure kind of just like entertainment, um, you know, and I can I can just like let it be cheap and silly. Mm -hmm. There, This feels like it's striving for something slightly more. So it means that almost by its nature, I have to be more critical of it, because it has bigger ambitions, which I feel bad for, because in many ways, I would say this is better than the vast majority of stuff that was, you know, that 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 was made by, you know, Empire and Full Moon, but it's, it's still um, it that ambition is almost its handicap. But I, I think I think you, were, you hit the nail mm -hmm. on the head with that, like because it, it sounds like we're we're dunking on this movie quite a bit, but it's also this is a movie that uh, demands to be taken a little bit more seriously than a lot of movies like Eliminators or something like that, which is clearly just sort of popcorn entertainment. This is an Empire film that is trying to be taken seriously. And so the the respect that we can show for it is to analyze it seriously, analyze it on its own terms. And I think it's a movie that lends itself to that. And it's in a weird kind of backwards way, even though we're not being particularly generous with it, it is sort of a compliment that we can talk about it in this way yeah. and well, dissect it and think about it in terms of like plot and character and structure. It's, so, it's so reliant, it's so dialogue heavy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. You know, we know about that because we have a very dialogue heavy film too but it's like it's this film in particular is so reliant on dialogue so reliant on the characters like imbuing the story because for the most part the setups aren't that moody like halfway through suddenly the cinematography got more moody because it was set in nighttime and it got a bit more creepy and stuff which was super fun i was like let's have more of that but yeah. it's so reliant on all of that that's why the writing needed to be really great and i just don't think that they were given the resources they needed to mm. make it shine as much as it could like a ryan johnson could mm. do something amazing yeah. right Absolutely. so it's like this i think that's it is for the most part it sounds like we're willing this film or we would have willed this film to have like pulled it off yeah yeah, and I, I, I do wish that it had been a more seamless execution, but I, I think generally this is a well-acted, like, uh, it's a smartly constructed movie in its at its core. I think it doesn't ultimately hold together. It has a few too many highs and lows and a, a little bit too much inconsistency, but but there's something here. There absolutely is something here that's interesting and, and uh, worth watching, and it's really very different from anything else that empire put out well it totally is and the ambitions here i mean this thing you know a lot of the empire you know little rubber monster creature type things are aspiring to you know maybe capitalize on some trends and and kind of emulate a, a similar movie that came out before it that on a bigger budget from a bigger studio which is totally understandable this one though is just such an odd duck because it's it's aspiring more to be like my dinner with Andre 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is aspiring mm-hmm. to be gremlins or critters or something yeah. along those mm-hmm. lines. Like, mean, love- it probably would have helped if they kept their original poster with Malcolm McDowell coming out of a toilet. I think that would have helped <laughs> with this at That's least amazing. a little bit. He'll get you in the end. He always will. I, I, I do love an odd duck and I will always adopt an odd duck. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm much happier with the caller existing than not existing. Let's put it that way. Like it's trying to do something, whereas it's not like rather than trying to be a copy of a copy of something, which there's far too much of even today. Like, mm-hmm. so from that perspective, I'm, I'm happy. I'm really happy to have seen it. I think, you know, it would be great if it was more readily available so people could actually see it because I think this one's, that it, this one is more worth watching than quite a lot of stuff that's out there. Yeah, and it lends itself. That ending, that ending is actually really cool. Like, you know, I did, definitely didn't see it coming. Um, and like the effects are great, and I love a good practical effect. So, yeah. I also love yeah, uh, the simplicity of just kind of like smoky red light in the woods, I think is always going to like uh, hit me in that kind of like that right sweet spot. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, I think that was kind of the weird thing where I kind of like ended the film. It did have a kind of like odd dreamlike quality which is why again i kind of you know could really have imagined watching this you know on a sleepless night you know when i was a teenager and this having some kind of like weird effect on me because it it, it's got a vibe as much as it's not fully successful there is a vibe to it it's very interesting that you brought up maholland drive and lynch because i do think there is a quality to it that you know that you can talk about with that where it doesn't quite it doesn't have the cinematic quality of a Lynch film. That's the thing with Lynch is that Mm. as much as you can say, what does any of this mean? There's a confidence with which everything is presented in the visual language of it, which makes you go, this feels intentional. Whereas I I watch say something like the caller. And again, it feels a little bit like I'm watching, I don't know, uh, Northern exposure or something like that. You know, if you want to talk about like nineties things set in cabins or something like that, you know, I'm not watching twin peaks. I'm watching Northern exposure. That's Mm -hmm. what it feels like. I mean, some of that David Lynchian quality kind of comes through here. I think just as a byproduct of the Italian production, you know, with everything being dubbed over, Mm -hmm. it always makes me feel a little soap opery, which is what Mulholland drive does too, to great effect. Um, But there is, there, there really is something here. And there's something I respect about this movie. If I don't love it, if it doesn't hang together completely, I, I still respect the hell out of it. I'm glad that they made it. And uh, I, I wish that they would take more. I wish more people would take big swings like this. Well, on the surface, mm-hmm. it looks like a straightforward thriller. And then it has that dreamlike quality. It has that uh, WTF factor to it. And so, Kira, you mentioned like if you caught this late at night. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Tubi. Mm, yeah. Streaming service Tubi. This this is one of those types of movies where like we've like we said, its ambitions are grander. So we've sort of taken it to task a little more than we would have on with some of these other films that we've talked about. But I think, you know, I often find myself just kind of scouring the depths of Tubi. Like mm-hmm. I'll just search and I'll go down a rabbit hole and I'll be like, I'll pick a movie I know that I like. And then I'll look at the recommendations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there's stuff I haven't even heard of in there. And I'm like, all right, let me check that one out. Let me see what that one's all about. And then you click on that one. And then I go to that one's recommendations. And Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm getting to a couple of degrees of something I haven't watched. If I were to have stumbled upon this, um, irrespective of the show, if I would have, if this would have came up on Tubi and I would have been the caller with Malcolm McDowell, 1987, I don't know what this movie is, read a plot synopsis and been like, all right, let me give this one a whirl. I think I would have walked away from this movie probably ready to recommend it to people to be like, hey, did you know that this movie with Mm. Malcolm McDowell and an actress in a cabin that is really weird? Like, did you know this movie existed? Because I didn't know this movie existed. I mean, I had watched it maybe a year or a year ago, um, just sort of uh, as Steve and I were diving into the show and picking movies that we were going to record with people there were other ones on the spreadsheet that jumped out to me where I went, I'm going to, I'm going to watch this now, even though we're not going to talk about it for God knows how long I'm going to, I'm going to just watch it uh, regardless. And so I did that with this movie, but had I not done that, this would have flew under the radar. And if this was one that I was a blind find on Tubi or something, I probably would have had more positive things than negative to say about it. Cause I do think it's got a lot of 
weird memorable moments and it's a big swing and it's appreciated when we talk about so many movies with these little tiny rubber monsters and things like that to have this sort of half prestige thing that still gives us some gnarly John Carl Beekler effects. Like, I don't know. It checks a lot of the boxes. It just needed to be tightened up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing is we, Kira and I talk about this a lot is like, well, what movies should actually be remade? Like rather than remaking movies that we already know and love, why don't we remake movies that have concepts that are good, but maybe one, you know, executed to the most high degree that could have been possible. And like, someone's going to be passionate about it. So I feel like this movie could definitely use that, you know, like you could make an interesting remake. You could definitely make it, you know, so that's always worth considering. And I think it's, it's also just really interesting the notion of how you approach and how you actually, um, you, you, you look at a movie critically. Cause I mean, even like we've had that with our movie where I think there's people who go into it expecting it to be like a, a, a sort of silly splatter film. And then they're suddenly confronted by all of this kind of, um, intense emotional drama and uh, you know and then there's people who go into it like expecting something super highbrow and then they get like the weird sort of like splatter and like, like the the dark comedy elements of it and they're and 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 you can like everything you kind of have to take on its own terms and its own its own value and you know and we've talked about how in many ways you know it's very flattering to us when people like hold us to high standards because it means that our film seems like worth to them seems worth holding to that high standard rather and than just engaging, dismissing it. Well, like engaging with it rather than, yeah. But it, it also means sometimes it's not necessarily going to live up to what people expect of it as or well. Or as we like to say in Britain, not their cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that expression. I don't think that's, I don't think that applies to us <laughs> at all. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Surge Cola? You mean not our cup of Surge <laughs> Cola? That's all not, we drink. Not their Mountain Dew. <laughs> not Mountain Dew. <laughs> not my uh, Mountain Dew. Not mine. No way. <laughs> uh, well, I think that about wraps it up for the caller. You guys, thank you so much for being here. This was really fun to dissect this movie uh, and and kind of uh, dig deep on a movie that nobody really digs deep on. So uh, this was a really... Can I just say, I do, yeah. do really love a little plastic monster as well. So Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm well, little plastic monsters too. Stick with us. We, we, we have a connection to a lot of little plastic monsters. So um, Right. And if every movie we watched was the caller... We would get sick of it and we would be pining for the days of little plastic monsters. So yeah, I, I, I say that this is a nice um, departure for an episode and the type of film. But, you know, we're, we're ready. Uh, every other movie, we're ready to get jump right back into kind of the, you know, the mission statement of Empire and Full Moon, which is just some l- low budget, uh, often with a tiny terror involved yeah. somewhere. Well, my, my favorite my favorite uh, thing was when Alex and I watched uh, Critters uh, for the first time. Alex just turned to me and went, "Needed more crit- ah, needed more critters." <laughs> <laughs> I would say that's true of most movies. I didn't <laughs> expect so much bowling in this movie. I just saw Challengers, very good movie. Could have used some more critters. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to see a love triangle between Zendaya I... and two Kreitz. I just I just went to watch the bikers. Not a single critter in the entire not, movie. Not one critter. Wow. You not just saved me my price of admission. So thank you. But no critters. Which is funny because Tom Hardy kind of looks like a guy made of critters, you know, when they form the big ball and like roll over people. Tom Hardy is gradually maybe turning they were into hiding that. them. Maybe maybe actually Tom Hardy is just a lot of critters like in a coat. You know, like you know, when you have like three kids in an overcoat, but it's just critters. I've I've often suspected. I've often suspected he's got he's he's made of too many circles. You know, it's, it it can't be a coincidence. A, a critter king, as we call that. A critter king. Yeah, exactly. They get all tied together. Um. All right. So so kill your lover. Uh, amazing looking movie. I have not had the chance to see this yet, but uh, uh Jared's been raving about it. Uh, where can people find this movie? You you guys are kind of touring it around still, right? Yes, so we're still on festival tour in Europe, but as far as North America is concerned, the film is out now. You can watch it on all your favorite VOD platforms. Um, We're on Apple TV, we're on Prime Video, uh, Voodoo Fandango, Hmm. uh, Microsoft Film and TV, which I did not realize was a thing uh, very recently, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) Google Play as well. Um, just for North America. Um, but the easiest way to find all of the links as well is if you just want to go to the website for the movie, which is kyl-movie.com. Um, you can find the where to watch button button there and 
make it real simple for you. Just click on it. Um, Amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I would I would add something, but you you kind of you kind of said it all Did there. I say so it all? Oh, yeah, you, you stole my thunder. I was gonna come. I thought we were gonna do like a two hander, oh, and then you kind of like you, you did it all. I mean, um, hopefully, uh, if you are not in North America, should be coming to some European festivals um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, but uh, we won't be able to announce those at the moment. Yes. Okay. Well, and Kira, it's not too late to reveal yourself to be a robot right now. If you wanted to steal some of that thunder back, you could you could rip off half of your face. I mean, I'm not the robot. Oh, that twist on twist. Okay. Double twist. Don't, don't don't call me out like that. <laughs> it probably should have guessed. People must not know. No, I've, I mean, I've, I am the British one, so it makes sense. You no, know, that I, is true. I, I, you're also British. I don't I, know what I'm talking about. I, you know, ba it's it's basically you know, Alex just like comes knocks at my door every day after sort of like watching me shower through the window. You know, I I yeah, that, that's 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 our relationship. Yeah. Well, that's the foundation of a long-lasting relationship, I think. So that's that's perfect. Eleven years and counting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. And if you like movies about, um, you know, tortured relationships, definitely check out Kill Your Lover on any of those VOD platforms. It's a ton of fun. I really, really enjoyed it when I saw it at Brooklyn Horror. And if you like what we do, you can jump on to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Drop us a little five-star rating and maybe a brief review if you feel so inclined to do so. If you want to see what Steve and myself are up to, you can follow us on basically all social media. We're on Instagram at PuppetMasters underscore Castle Freaks. You can also follow me at underscore Jallo underscore Jerry or Steve at Minotaur Matador. Uh, if you are on X or Threads or Blue Sky or YouTube, you can find uh, information about the show and audio files of the episodes on YouTube as well, uh, if that's the way that you want to consume the show. But uh, we are not the only show that Steve's involved in that you should be consuming. Steve, what else do you need to plug? Well, I also have a show called Cinema Arcade. That's cinema and arcade mashed together. That's what we do. We watch a movie and then we play the video game based on that movie. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun to dig into. I have no idea where our uh, release schedule is at the moment that y'all are hearing this. We're so far ahead of that show. But I know this week I'm going to record an episode about Surf Ninjas from 1993, you know, which absolutely needs to be discussed. We have episodes recently on uh, Chronicles of Riddick and, uh, 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 you know, a whole bunch of other things. So definitely check that out and be sure to check us out next week as well, because we have an interesting one that I have not seen. Uh, it's from 2014 and it is called Trophy Heads. And this one Looks really fun because this is a Charles Band uh, directorial uh, effort. Uh, he wrote it as well, and it is absolutely stocked to the brim with Scream Queens from oh, yeah. uh, the '80s and '90s. So you got your Linnea, St your, your, Linnea your Linnea Quigley. You got uh, your our friend Denise Duff. We've got uh, Brink Stevens. We got Michelle Bauer. We got a we got a bunch of like heavy hitter Scream Queens from the '80s and early '90s. So uh, I'm excited to check that one out. Yeah, we've been, uh, you know, just coincidentally, I think we've been having a real string uh, leading up to this episode on The Caller where we've just been hitting kind of like some real sleazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's all been mostly stuff from the 80s, uh, you know, that kind of like mid 80s Times Square sleaze. But now we're getting into something that's really only 10 years old. But I think in spirit goes pretty well with a lot of the, the things that we've been watching. So, you know what? We've been hanging around this, uh, you know, these pretentious, uh, you know, higher ambition, award seeking type films for too long. <laughs> Read one episode. <laughs> And we're going right Not back. Exactly. To I thought you were referring to. Uh, I thought you were referring to robot holocaust and breeders, you know. But yeah, no, that that probably would not uh, apply to this. But yeah, we're getting back into the sleaze, some full moon era, uh, later full moon era sleaze. So tune in next week for trophy heads. Thank you to Alex and Kier once again for being here. We had so much fun uh, talking about this one, and uh, we will see you next time. So long. <laughs> <laughs>